calculate less than 10%. Uh, I found an easy way to track it is just to get an app to actually track your foods. And there's ones that you can like scan barcodes or it's, it makes it easier to actually track that less than 10%. So. Yeah, it has a pretty high level. You can do three tablespoons of flaxseed. The nice thing about flaxseed is it's um, also really good for the gut, and for some reason it facilitates good gut bacteria as well. So uh, it's really about the bacteria. I think that really influences the, uh, that's why the fat has influence. So oil tends to be spoiled, because when you get it in a store, it's probably who knows how old. And then you feed that to your bacteria, and it'll facilitate the bad bacteria growing or um, a lot of the animal products will feed the bad bacteria. But flaxseed is very high in fiber. It's going to feed your good bacteria. And what's nice about flaxseed is the omega-3s. I just, I just love that. But um, for your gut, it's diff Oh, that's the other thing about flaxseed. It's very good if you're constipated. It's, it's a very potent stimulator to get things going. So, uh, <laughs> and that's a very important process. We'll talk about that later. So nature's remedies, I, I don't want to call it just like herbal remedies because we're going to talk about a variety of different things and we use this in our home so I'm kind of just wanted to share some of the things we use and some of the experiences we've had with them. I, you know, I hope I don't get myself in trouble with this presentation but we'll see. <laughs> okay, water. And none of this is meant to be medical advice, just a heads up. But if you want some help, I'm happy to talk with you and, and see if there's anything we can, um, we can figure out together. Water, internal use, there's two ways to use water. Obviously, we know drink, drinking water is healthy for you. Uh, you. It's important to get a clean water source. Uh, you know, like Flint, Michigan, you heard that there was like lead contamination in the water. If you have a bad water source, it can be very unhealthy for you. So it's important. Uh, what we do in our household is we get a reverse osmosis filter under our kitchen sink, and so we have a separate faucet that kind of reverse osmosis filters everything out, and it'll filter a lot of the metals or whatever. I, I, you could get your water tested and see if it's okay, um, but we just, we just put a filter in and, and do it that way. And that's the water we drink. They have some really nice springs around here, actually, on my way uh, along Butts Canyon. Springs used to be the, the best source of water you can get uh, in times past, I still think it is the best source of water. But if you're concerned about your spring, you want to get tested, you can get that tested too and see if it's okay. So there's two ways to use water. Obviously, drink water. Uh, do other things hydrate you well? So-so, you know, you don't want to drink a lot of water because you can get rid of your, the minerals in your blood. And so you, there's a balance, right? You, water can actually kill you if you drink enough in one sitting. And that happened, I think it was in a radio show. There was a competition, a water drinking competition, and someone actually died from drinking too much water. It's, so it, it is possible. So there's internal use. And if you're drinking a lot of water, you want to make sure you're replacing your electrolytes too. So that's important. Because it's going to, when you drink a lot of water, you're going to start going to the bathroom a lot, but what's going to go is also your electrolytes. So that's why you have to replace that. The other way to use water is external use, and I'll give some examples of hydrotherapy and how we use it in our house. So this is kind of small up there, but I think you guys could probably see it okay. Uh, there's one thing that's really good for you, and I'm not sure if you want to do it because it's not very comfortable is cold water immersion. Actually, it really boosts your system up a lot. And I believe that the human body was supposed to be in extreme conditions at times and adjusting. But since we can always keep a nice level temperature all the time with air conditioners and heaters, it doesn't get exposed to that. And to some degree, I think it, it's, it's weaker because we find that a cold immersion actually can really boost um, the levels of brown adipose, we didn't think that you can increase your brown adipose levels. But what brown adipose tissue is, it actually burns fat for you. It's a fat tissue in your body that burns fat. So people are always wondering how you do it. Well, cold immersion usually 
11 minutes per week cumulative, meaning you don't have to do 11 minutes at once. But, and the temperature, it doesn't have to be ice cold. You probably can't tolerate that when you first do it. You can start at a, as cold as is tolerable and kind of move up. So that's a, tr this is a tricky one to do. I like to do that. I'm trying to incorporate more. Um, I had a friend who would always send pictures of jumping into some random body of water that looked very cold, and there'd be snow around, and I'm like, you're crazy. But then I read all the studies on, on uh, cold immersion and <laughs> the health benefits. I was like, well, he's not so crazy because he never got sick either. So it was kind of interesting. Uh, one I use a lot is hot, cold contrast showers. And how you do that is three minutes hot, one minute cold for a total of three cycles. So you go under the hot, you turn it to the hottest that you can tolerate. If you're diabetic or you have decreased sensitivity, you want to be careful with some of these because sometimes you can't tell if it's too hot and you can get burnt. But if, you know, your sensitivity is normal, turn it as hot as you can tolerate. You don't want it hot, like comfortable hot, where you're just kind of sitting there relaxing because that's not the heat for whatever you're using it for. You want it hot to where you're kind of like roasting in there and you have to turn yourself like you're getting, <laughs> like, you're, it's like it's hot, but um, not to the point of burning. So after that three minutes, you do one minute of cold, as cold as you can tolerate, and then you repeat it for three cycles. What do I use these, this for? Typically, if I feel like I'm getting sick or if I'm going into a situation where I could get sick, like a high possibility. I'm traveling on a plane or something of that nature. This is when I might incorporate some of this. What it does is it stimulates the system to get the immune system functioning at the high level so that if anything, you do get exposed to something, at least your body's already activated to get started. Uh, another way to do that is a hot, cold contrast bath, which instead of doing a shower, you're going to do it in a bath. Um, you got to be careful with any bath because you're going to sweat a lot. You need to make sure you're drinking and staying hydrated. Um, the key thing when you're doing anything with a hot bath is when you're getting out, plug, unplug the drain. Because <laughs> if you pass out, you don't want to be in a full body of water passing out. So that's a really important point. Um, maybe don't try the hot bath <laughs> if you're not familiar and you don't have anyone to supervise you when you're doing that. But um, it's a similar purpose. So what I do is if if I, my throat's getting scratchy, I know everyone's been sick around me in the office or something like that. That night, uh, if I'm symptomatic or if I'm not symptomatic, either way, I might do it that night. And to me, um, it really helps me not to be sick for long periods of time. Because I actually, I want to get back to work and be able to do what I need to do in my office. So fresh air is obviously, it's actually healing. So you can... Um, it will purify you. Your lungs actually release a lot of toxins in that way. So if you're breathing wrong, you're not releasing sufficient toxins. Portions of your lungs will actually start to collapse if you're not breathing deep enough. So this is very important. One of my physician colleagues, I have yet to go look at the research sometime, but uh, this is at a depression training course. He was telling me that there's a study where they did just a breathing intervention for depression. And they did 20 minutes of really trying to take as deep a breath as you possibly can. And they were actually able to have dramatic impact on depression just with that one intervention. So it makes a difference when you're getting good fresh air into your lungs. Um, out here, you guys have beautiful trees. You have pine trees and all, all sorts of trees. You breathe that in. The, if you breathe in the air in the forest, they, they, there was a study done, I think it was in Japan. Uh, you can actually increase your natural killer cells just from going out, walking in the forest, and breathing in all that fresh air and all smelling all the cedar. And they think it might be related to either the pine or the cedar fragrances. They're not, uh, I can't remember which oil they tested and it proved to actually increase your natural killer cells like that. So fresh air is important. City air is typically not fresh. I, you can smell the difference sometimes, especially if you're coming from here. It, it's, there's a lot of pollution and... Um, that's unfortunate. But one thing we don't think about is indoor air being polluted. And so the EPA said Americans on average spend approximately 90% of their time indoors. That's true. Where the concentrations of some pollutants are often two to five times higher than typical outdoor concentrations. So being indoors for
for long periods of time can be toxic to you as well. So you want to get outside. You want to get the windows open in your house as frequently as you can to air the house out and get it nice and fresh. Is indoor pollution increasing or decreasing? What do you think? Drastically going up. Uh, the reason is, it says indoor concentrations of some pollutants have increased in recent decades due to such factors as energy efficient building construction. When it lacks sufficient mechanical ventilation to ensure adequate air exchange and increased use of synthetic building materials, furnishings, personal care products, pesticides, household cleaners, all these things, you got a lot more indoor air pollution. And that is not going to have a positive effect on your health. You want to make sure you're getting these things aired out. If you ever change the flooring in your house, luxury vinyl, you'll smell it for a, a while, actually, um, or even laminate. So a lot of these materials, they have these, this off-gassing period, and you go through it. So you, when you change flooring, I recommend changing it during a time you're going to be able to open the windows for a long period of time so that you can get all that stuff aired out. But it usually is for a, a few years if you just let it sit there and not air it out. So indoor air pollution is getting worse due to energy efficient construction. So if there's no ventilation, a lot of the houses today, and some contractors tell me this, they're being built to where the airflow is not good through the house, even if you open the windows. I lived in a house like that. That was our last home. Uh, you open the windows, and it's like there's no air movement in here. Well, that's probably how it was constructed to be. So a lot of um, construction is not building it to where the air flows smoothly through the house. So I like having big windows. Uh, it's my preference because it'll actually get the air flowing. And I, I'm grateful our current house has big windows <laughs> to do that. So increased use of artificial man-made chemicals was the other cause, right? So when you're sick, I'm going to ask you a question. When you're sick, are you mostly in fresh air or inside air? You know, it's a tendency you get sick, you go in your bed, you close the windows, and you just lay there and get sick, right? Well, it makes you sicker because the fresh air was meant to help you kind of get, get things out of your system, right? So it can sometimes make us sicker than we needed to be just being in the wrong conditions. So this is just like a, what we were talking about, forest bathing. There are now studies showing forest bathing is amazing for mood, it's amazing for your immune system, and it's basically just going out for a weekend and just being out in a place that's more natural than the big city, right? So especially if you have relatives in the big city, tell them you need to go do some forest bathing and maybe send them some studies on it. So, But it, it's, it's very important to just be outdoors and, and experiencing nature, and it's, it helps our body. Nutrition, what is nutrition? Food that will produce good blood, right? You want to have the right foods so that you're actually producing healthy blood that's going to support your body. So I like to look back at like what was God's original plan for nutrition and diet. We saw that in Genesis 129 and we talked about a whole food plant-based diet was what he originally gave to his people. So God's original diet for man is a whole food plant-based diet. And the closer whole food meaning you're prepping it from scratch. Does that take time? It does. It does. So plant-based means it's coming from plants. So this, it's very simple. Uh, so I'm going to do a quick quiz for you guys. Is that whole food plant-based? Yeah, even if it was veggie meat, it's really not whole food, right? It's processed, and so that's not whole food plant-based. What about that right there? Yeah, just nice fruits and vegetables. That's dandelion. Dandelion is so good. We're going to talk about dandelion uh, a little later. <laughs> not, definitely not whole food and nor plant-based. The bread. <laughs> so avocado, yes. Uh, these are that's a pretty easy one. How about that one? If it's homemade, right? You know, I was in shock because I look at the bread on the shelves of the store, and they stay good for so long. And it made me think. You know, I didn't think about this until I baked my own bread. When you bake your own bread, you don't have very long to eat it. Maybe a week it'll be good. But it goes bad very quickly. And if you go to bakeries and things, uh, I know overseas, like in Italy, they like throw it out the same day. They don't keep it more than a day. But yet we have bread that's sitting on the shelf for 
over a month, probably more. What is in that bread? That's the real question, right? And that's the real mystery of the, of the United States is what's in the food. So I don't know what to tell you, but I've, I've had patients say they had to literally quit eating bread from the store and make their own bread because it was making them sick and with autoimmune diseases and things. So I, I've never researched all the chemicals involved, and I can't tell you for certain what it is. But it's probably the preservatives. The preservatives are, are going to be chemicals. And then whatever might be contained in the wheat, if it's not organic, even some of the organic too, actually. So genetic modification, we've heard that this is, is bad for our health. And we're finding that the more of these crops we eat, the sicker we can get sometimes. And so some people, you know, I, I went to an autoimmune reversal training program. And this was a big thing. You just couldn't eat any of those crops that are pot even potentially genetically modified. And people got better. And in the medical world, we don't do too good with autoimmune disease. Typically, we have to suppress your immune system. And, and that can put you at risk for infectious diseases and things like that. But this, uh, this program I went to is called Years Restored. It's um, like just north of Sacramento. And she was giving, I was watching what she's doing. People were getting better within a few days, just feeling amazing like severe, immobilizing joint pains, and they're going to this program, they're detoxing, and they're not eating anything that could potentially have chemicals, and they do really well. So there's something in this, because autoimmune disease is actually on the rise. I don't know if we realize that, but it's, we have to think about what is creating these situations. So genetic modification methods, when it says non-GMO, that means it wasn't genetically modified a specific way. So that's something key to remember. So genetic engineering is like these specific laboratory methods to implant a specific gene. But gen non-GMO does not include hybridization. So that's a technique where you literally just randomly shoot radiation at the plant and see if you get a different result from the genetic mutations created. And if you get something nice, you'd be like, OK, we'll keep this one. So it's very nonspecific, so it's not considered GMO. Does that make sense? So, I know, what a world we live in. So most common GMO foods today, 94% of all soy is GMO. 92% of all corn, 95% of all canola, 99.9% .9 of all sugar beets. What do you think they use sugar beets to create? Sugar. So if it doesn't explicitly say cane sugar, then it's probably from sugar beets. And so if you look at the ingredients, and it, it, if it doesn't say cane sugar, it's coming from the sugar beet, which is... 99.9% .9 chance that it's genetically modified, even if they think it is not. There was something being done in, um, I was in college, and one of the farmers came and did a presentation where people's farms were getting taken over by big companies. What they were doing is spilling seed onto the farms with the genetically modified patent, right? So now what happens is that patented crop starts to grow in their crop, which was not originally patented, because they start to you know, mix and everything like that, that plants naturally do. Well, then their whole farm becomes GMO, or whatever the patent was. So then they'll come to the farm, they'll test it, they'll say, hey, you're growing our product, you need to cut all this down or give us your farm. And it was really sad to hear that from the farmers at that time. This was years ago. I don't know who knows what they're doing now, but it was very shocking to to hear that. But it's sometimes I don't want to know. <laughs> sometimes I don't want to know these things, but I'm glad that God is teaching me them so that he's teaching me the importance of I think it's important to grow your food. Um, so I, I try. I can't say I'm not 100%, but I grow I try to grow what I can. Kale is pretty, I, li I like low maintenance. I don't want to be sitting out there all day trying to figure out if this thing is going to live, and then it dies. So I just want low maintenance things. That's what I pick. And so then we're dealing with insecticides, herbicides, pesticides, sprayed foods, and people always argue that about plants, and that's true. Yes, there is possibility to expose to those things. Usually when a spray is done, like if you use an airplane, it'll go for quite a long range. It's not like it's going to stay just on the farm. It'll go and spread by vent, you know, the air and the airflow to other farms. So that's why to, considered, to be considered organic, you have to be a certain distance away from a farm that's not organic. 
And there's like specific criteria. So you can't just like buy any land and be organic. You have to make sure you're a certain distance away. So this is called the dirty dozen. These are crops that will tend to be, have contaminants in them, right? The highest likelihood. Strawberries, spinach, kale, collard and mustard greens, peaches, pears, nectarines, apples, grapes, bell and hot peppers, cherries, blueberries, and green beans. You can see it tends to be the fruits that you eat the skin. So this is called a dirty dozen because these are ones that you, you definitely want to buy organic because you're going to get exposed to high levels of chemicals if you don't buy it organic. So that poses that question, right? Does organic really matter? Because people like to argue about this all the time. But when they looked into it, what they found is if you get organic produce, you'll get more polyphenol antioxidants, so more of the, the good stuff in the fruit. The other thing is conventional produce contains twice the levels of cadmium, mercury, and lead when they tested it. So you're more likely to get heavy metal toxicity eating inorganic produce. Finally, you can reduce your exposure to pesticides. So these are things they actually looked at. I know they've done studies where they look at people's blood and test specific chemicals, and they find you get more higher levels in the blood when you eat inorganic versus things that are organic. So it does, it does make a difference. So an interesting fact, higher cancer rates have been noted in areas where agricultural spraying is done compared to areas where it is not done. So um, if you're living near a region like that, you might want to have a regular practice of detoxifying your blood and trying to help get chemicals out because it's more than likely you're getting exposed to um, I know there's a lot of documentaries about this where people are living next door. And it's just as bad as if you live next door to a fast food place. If you can smell the oil from the fast food place, the rates of cancer are extremely high if you live next to a fast food joint um, because of that aerosolization. Things do get into our body through the air, but it's, it's also higher. There's a documentary for Napa Valley. I think it's called Children of the Vine. Uh, it was interesting but it talks about some of these things they're finding. So the most effective healing through food will minimize your toxin exposure because you don't want to get exposed to toxins when you're eating. It'll maximize nutritional value, maximize medicinal value. So those are the three things you really want to look for when you're eating your food. My glaucoma patients, every one of them, I tell them, you got to add these two things to your diet, kale, organic kale, and blueberries, organic blueberries. Um, because I've found that for my glaucoma patients, they don't progress when they eat those two things regularly and I keep their eye pressure under control. Um, and so a lot of times it's just lifestyle factors that are raising their eye pressure, not sleeping, high stress, or things like that. And once we address those things, they do just fine. And a lot of times I can avoid them needing an eye drop or a medication. So. But yeah, those are the two foods for the eyes. Super healthy for the retina and really healthy for the optic nerve. Uh, I believe there was a study on kale specifically looking at visual field changes because you worry about you losing your peripheral vision when you get glaucoma. And they found that people actually slightly improved when they were using the kale intervention. So I had a lady, she was going blind. I had no clue what was going on. And we were doing all this testing. I sent her to the neuro-ophthalmologist. We had no clue. I said, you know what? I know kale is amazing for the <laughs> optic nerve. How about we do that? Let's see if, if it even improves your vision a little bit or even stops it. That's great. And she actually got started getting better. Um, there was a limited amount of better, but she saw more, and she was grateful. She can still drive at least, and she has not gotten worse since. So I don't know. I can't explain everything. But I know it's great for the optic nerve. So kale is one of those things I definitely use for the optic nerve. Nutritional and practical application. So detox foods. If you want to really help your body get rid of toxins and have max nutritional value, pick foods that help to detox your body. And we're going to talk about what those are. Temperance. Don't eat things that you know are bad for you. I mean, it's, that's kind of self-explanatory, they tend to be the most addictive things that you're going to crave. So I remember I, you know, I used to eat a lot of chips, and I looked at all the chips that I loved. Like I just, man, I couldn't get enough of them. And I found out they all, the ones I really craved, 100% had MSG in them. <laughs> 
And I was like, no wonder I'm craving these things. Well, MSG stimulates your appetite. So you actually don't get full. You just keep wanting to eat more and more and more. And it's a typical tactic to keep you eating their product and craving it, right? But MSG will do that. Certain restaurants will actually put MSG in their food. And you're wondering, oh, why it's so good? So that's why some restaurants say MSG free because they're just trying to make a disclaimer. We're not trying to just hook you to our food. Moderation is using things that are healthful in moderation, right? That's what um, temperance is. So you don't want to take what's healthy and do too much of it, right? So uh, an example of that is eating all day long. Some people advocate that. Your digestive tract needs to rest as, as well as the rest of your body. And it rests when you stop eating. So you have to give it like four to five hours. The reason I say four to five hours is because it's going to digest your food probably in about two or so hours. But after that, your digestive organs, they've just used all these enzymes and all these other things. They need time to recover and rebuild so that they're ready for your next meal. So you have to give your digestive tract some rest to be ready for your next meal. So, All right, so temperance... No, obviously no explicit drugs. And there are some things that are drugs that sometimes we don't consider drugs. So examples of harmful substances, illegal and legal drugs, cocaine, meth, uh, etc. cetera. I, I say legal because I joke, I joke with my staff. I say, as a physician, I'm basically a legalized drug dealer. And I, I was, obviously I'm joking with them, but you know, I think about this story when I was in residency. There was a, a patient we had, and he was addicted to drugs. Um, he was addicted to opiates, heroin, and things like that. And, I, you know, I was just covering the night call. He came. He had, a, he, he had some pain issues. And he had a real reason to have pain issues. He had a very severe phlebitis, which is his uh, veins were infected. And so I said, you know, I guess we'll have to give him something. And I, I gave him an extra dose of what he was already written for, which was morphine. And I looked back at that, and I was like, you know what? I was just basically doing whatever I was taught to do. And I, I kind of feel bad about that. But, you know, a few days later, they found out that he was not only getting the hospital opiates, he was also bringing in his own opiates into the hospital and using it on top of that. So he ended up coding, and he was, I think he was less than 30 years old. And he ended up passing away. And it just really stuck with me because I just thought about it like he's wanting to get the hospital-based drugs too. So they, they also are very addictive. Actually, uh, they're tracing a lot of the opiate addictions back to the medical world. And that's where it started for a lot of these people. So it's a sad situation. So now they're super aggressive about not using opiates. Whereas maybe 10 years ago, it was like, you better control their pain, otherwise you're going to get decreased reimbursement. And I'm like, it's such, we've basically created a problem, and now we're trying to backtrack on everything, and it, it really is a mess. Poisonous herbs and mushrooms, marijuana, psychotic mushrooms, psychedelic mushrooms as well. Some people are promoting that for different mental health conditions, and I, I personally don't recommend those things. Legal addiction substances, so obviously alcohol and tobacco, but a lot of people can't function their day without caffeine. I mean, you look at the Starbucks line, it's, it wraps around. Sometimes it goes to the, into the street for, uh, if you're in the big city. So to me, that's a sign that there's something in there that I probably don't want to get involved with, right? So you would say caffeine, like why would caffeine have any negative impact on your body? Well, the facts about caffeine, it, it, it's currently, this is what it, they write in the literature. This is currently the world's most popular psychoactive drug. That's literally what the scientific literature calls it, a psychoactive drug. And the source is obviously coffee, tea, cacao beans, uh, soda, energy drinks, even lotions. They're putting coffee in lotions, so be careful because they'll, uh, whatever's on your skin will get into the rest of your body too, so... It means it has an impact on your mind, and specifically, uh, this is just like psychologic effects on your mind, because it is a stimulant, right? So there's stimulants, and there's those that are like downers or depress you, such as opiates. So those are the kind of the two types and categories. And then there's hallucinogens. Those are the three main categories.
So in the psychiatric manual, there are specific conditions related to caffeine. Uh, caffeine withdrawal, so that's exactly like a drug. You have withdrawal symptoms, caffeine dependence, caffeine intoxication, caffeine-induced anxiety, caffeine-induced sleep disorder. So this is recognized in the medical community that caffeine does create problems, especially on a psychological level. So what caffeine does is it blocks your adenosine receptors. And adenosine functions to promote and maintain sleep. So if I'm blocking my adenosine receptor, guess what's going to happen? I'm not going to want to go to sleep. So that's why people feel this energy. But the reason they're probably tired a lot of times is probably because they needed to get healthy sleep or adequate sleep. And then it's um, adenosine is actually to protect your nerves. So if you're removing a protection for your nerves, you can call that a neurotoxin. That's how I consider it, right? And it blocks pain receptors. And so people have increased perception of pain if you're blocking adenosine. So caffeine's effect on the brain. Caffeine causes vasoconstriction. Vaso meaning blood vessel. Constriction meaning it's causing it to get a smaller opening than it currently has. And so they found that it reduces blood flow to the brain. When we talked about the prefrontal cortex, it's very important because when that's functioning, it can help to regulate and inhibit, and that's where faith is exercised. Caffeine actually reduces cerebral blood flow by 20 to 30 percent. And they, they, I believe they used the uh, functional MRI. I can't remember how they were testing that, but it's just very interesting that it would have such a profound impact on the blood flow to your brain. So how do I use, can I use temperance like therapeutically? The way you can use it therapeutically is intermittent fasting. Have you guys ever heard of that? It's emerging, it, the health outcome of intermittent fasting is amazing. It has so many different positive effects. And so what is it? It's basically, oh, these are the positive effects. It increases ketone bodies, improves mitochondrial function. Your mitochondria is a little organelle in your cells that is in charge of producing energy. So that's working good, high energy, high mitochondrial function, you're gonna have energy. Your body's gonna have energy to heal, so, so many advantages to having healthy mitochondria. Well, intermittent fasting will improve the function of your mitochondria. We found that in COVID, one of the big areas it hits, uh, especially with spike protein, is your mitochondrial function plummets. And so, intermittent fasting for someone who's struggling with long COVID or any spike protein exposure issues is very important, right? I would say it's one of the most important things to do is incorporate intermittent fasting. Some people experience drastic improvements just doing that without it, any other changes. It improves endothelial function, meaning, remember the endothelium is the lining of the blood vessel, so that's functioning better and regulating blood flow better. It enhances autophagy. Autophagy is your body breaking down unhealthy cells. So as a cell ages, obviously something has to take care of it and get rid of it from the body. Well, that's what autophagy is. Or if there's a virally infected cell or things of that nature, what your body does is it'll go and get rid of that, and that's called autophagy. And so that's very important. It's a reparative process, right? Your body's constantly changing. Cells are constantly, your, your red blood cells are, are changing very rapidly. There's a huge turnover. So you have to help your body be able to do that, and intermittent fasting does. Enhances your immune system. If you're looking for immune system boosting, intermittent fasting is the way to go. And this is a really big one. It prevents blood clots. It, it just really helps your blood to stay nice and clean and, and clear and flowing. So what is it? The, the best way to do intermittent fasting I've found is limit your meals to within a five-hour period. So like uh, just a I tell people just breakfast and lunch, and that's it. No snacking, nothing else in between, nothing else after. So after that second meal, nothing that's going to require digestion. So just water, basically. So that's intermittent fasting. Obviously, most people doing intermittent fasting are doing it for a specific reason. So you don't have to do it the rest of your life, but you can do it the rest of your life. You can do two meals a day and just have your body constantly in this state, which it's not going to hurt. You're definitely going to lose some weight, but it, it's, it's very good. I think we were, I believe we were recommended to eat, as Advent is recommended to eat two meals a day. And... Uh, depending on your activity level. So some people can't eat 
two, like a large meal in one sitting. And so it's better for them to do three meals. But uh, some people can actually eat a large meal in one sitting, and it's actually better to do two meals in those situations. Rest. Okay, I'm not going to go too heavily into this, but there's two types of rest. There's your daily rest. You have to get sleep every night. And then there's the weekly rest, or just that pause, that Sabbath gives you to just take a break from the work life and all these other things that are going on and just connect with God. We talked about spiritual health yesterday and the importance of just connecting with God in that way. So every hour of sleep before 12 midnight is worth two hours of sleep. What we found out is it's related to the melatonin secretion. So the earlier you can get to sleep, you don't want to go to sleep like in the middle of the day, but like when the sun sets, maybe start getting ready to go to bed because that's typically what was supposed to happen in life before the advent of lights and things like that. So, so every hour of sleep before 12 midnight is worth two hours of sleep. And so if you go to bed early, like if you didn't eat a big dinner before you got to sleep, you'll find out that naturally you wake up a lot earlier. So if you accidentally went to bed at like 8 o'clock, you'll be like super wide awake, like 2 or 3 o'clock. And that's because you've got technically a lot of sleep if you use that rule, right? So this is about sleep deprivation. And we learned about this in residency because we tended to be sleep deprived in residency. So the BAC, the, the blood alcohol concentration of 0.05%, which is almost breaking the legal limit for driving or considered intoxicated, this will impair your judgment. But it's comparable to being up around 10.38 p.m. and to 12.17 a.m. So that's what they found is people, their functionality was very similar to someone who had been drinking about three or four drinks at around 10.38 to 12.17. So we can see that the less we sleep, the more impaired our judgment gets. And that's a very important thing. I think that's why a lot of people end up doing midnight snacks is because you probably didn't want to eat that midnight snack. <laughs> But you've been staying up, and now your judgment is like going more limbic instead of prefrontal. And you, now you can't control it, and you do the midnight snack. So just don't stay up to midnight. BAC, the blood alcohol concentration of 0.1%, that's intoxication. Like you, are, you can't drive on the road at that level. I think 0 0.08 is the limit. It was comparable to those who stayed up between 11.28 to 1.23 a.m. They were kind of paralleling. So I was like... You need to get to bed at night. Sometimes if you ever stayed up late and your conversation just shifts and you're like, maybe I shouldn't have stayed up that late. That used to happen to me in college. I stayed up, you know, just reckless, just staying up to like 3 or 4 a.m. And then one day we were just having a conversation. I was just saying things that just didn't make any sense. And I said, it's probably better not to stay up this late. And I just never did it again <laughs> because, you know, you don't want to. It's like when someone's intoxicated, right? They'll say stuff, they'll just speak their mind, they look back and like, what was I saying, you know? It's, it's kind of the same thing when we don't sleep. In residency, it was sad, I, I, obviously I'm on shift, and I stayed 43 hours straight. And I did over 40 hours two times. The second, I think the second time I actually fell asleep while trying to examine somebody, because my, you know, in eyes, you have your little machine and you're like looking at them, and they're behind the machine, so they can't see your eyes. Well, I don't know how long I fell asleep, but he must have thought I was really looking deep in there, and I wasn't. So it, it's a, we have to just stop and get some sleep. And they tested individuals on a heavy night call, because you might think on a night-to-night -night basis. But if you deprive, they found that people on heavy call, meaning they're on call every fourth or fifth night, after that period when they tested them, after they finished their four weeks of call, they were similar to someone who had had three to four drinks. And so there's a lingering effect if you're going to have periods where your sleep is irregular for a few weeks. Now imagine your sleep is irregular for a few months or a few years. Now you're like chronically impaired and now you're having a hard time regulating your limbic system. Well, it's because of that sleep issue. Blue light. Blue light is the light that has this kind of cold look, right? I think hospital, that's the blue lights. And what blue light does is it tells your body it's still daytime. So your body doesn't produce melatonin. So if you have a lot of people switching to LEDs, they want the bright, you know, the brightest you can get. 
And you have to look at the, um, the Kelvin. It'll usually say like daylight, the uh, daylight coloring. All those things are really going to impair your melatonin secretion at night. It's going to impair what the quality of the sleep you get, the restfulness and the, of the recovery. So it makes a big difference. Try not to expose yourself. Phones, there's a night setting now for iPhones because of this. And um, that reduces the drop in melatonin that you get from the screen. So we're in a screen world. We have to think about these things. But I turn off all blue light in my house. My wife is always like, why are you always doing this? I'm like, look, our melatonin, this is serious. <laughs> so, but but, uh, but um, I try to get all the blue light off at once the sun sets because naturally I was supposed to be triggering melatonin and going to sleep. So blue light tells the body it's daytime. You want to avoid blue light. Turn on night mode on your phones. It's usually a yellowish looking screen if it's on night mode instead of the, the bright light. Physical activity. I'm not going to get too heavy into this, but um, what's, what's recommended, there's two different things. There's intentional, and then there's incidental. A lot of patients tell me, oh, yeah, I'm active. Like, I, for work, I walk back and forth, uh, carrying stuff. And it's like, there's, the health benefits were noticed from the intentional exercise. You make a decision, I'm going to do this to try to get healthier. There's like a purpose in it, or just kind of just detox. And they found that the benefit is better when you actually also do that intentional exercise. Any question? For sure, for sure. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that the, the work-related exercise is not good, but uh, a lot of the health benefit you can get just from taking that, that walk where you're not in a work mode when you're getting the exercise. It really helps even more. So activity, purpose of improved health. Those are the key things for intentional exercise. Intensity, honestly, getting a walk, um, you want to do your moderate intensity. So if you can sing while you're walking, you're probably not walking like you're, if you're trying to get a health benefit. You're just taking a stroll and getting some fresh air, basically. If you're able to talk, but you can't sing, that's where you want to get. You can still talk, but you, you can't sing. Now, intense is you can't even talk. And uh, I'm sure if you've ever done intense workouts, you've experienced that. And weekly, 150 minutes of moderate exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise is kind of the metrics for the best. But the more active you can get, the better. You can over-exercise. I had a patient, his glaucoma was getting worse, and he looked super healthy. And his pressures were fine every time he saw me. But every time I saw him, he's getting worse. And I'm like, well, this is not good. He was doing... I think it's called ultra marathons. And so every time he did an ultra marathon, his optic nerve would go down. And I said, I'm sorry, I hate to say this. It's over 100 miles of running. That's too much exercise. So I had to tell him to quit the ultra marathons, just stick to maybe marathons or something a lot lighter. So, yeah, and he stopped progressing. Yeah, it was sad because he just, that was, that was his thing. He just loved it, but I was like, I don't love watching your optic nerve go bad and your peripheral vision decline on me. Gardening is a great exercise to do. You know, we talk about purposeful uh, activities. It's funny because in some prisons they did gardening and they had some amazing results. This is what they described the, the prisoners that were gardening. The men who work in the garden feel, feel differently about themselves. They have been given trust. In the eight years I've been in my job, not one prisoner working in the gardens has been placed on governor's report for disobeying rules. So in these prison systems, they had drastic impacts on people by having them go work in the garden. And they noticed it. What we found is in the soil, there are certain organisms that actually affect your mood, and they can actually work to counteract depression and a lot of other issues. And so when you work with them more, they become your microbiome, and then it can naturally change the flow of your body. You can see how there's an intimate relationship between the, the bacteria and other things like that in our body and our health. So we don't seem to have any trouble in the garden. The guys come out and they enjoy it. They ask to come out at weekends and work extra shifts. Wow, we can get that going around here. I, 
I know there was a period where you couldn't find anybody to go to work. But in the garden, apparently, these prisoners are really enjoying it. It makes the time go quicker. Now, is it harmful to be inactive? Let's say I do 150 minutes of exercise a week, but I'm inactive the rest of the time. Is that bad? Even though I exercise every day. Well, they found that if you sit six or more hours a day, it's going to increase your risk of pretty much everything. It's going to make you sicker. So why is that? Well, we talk about cir- to the two ingredients, good blood and perfect circulation. When you sit, all that blood from the, the legs is not coming up anymore because you're blocking the, vein, the venous flow. And so if the blood's not coming back to the heart, it's not pumping out, it's not detoxing through the lungs. So there's toxins building up in the legs while you're just sitting. And then once you finally get up, the blood's returning, but it has a ton of toxins in there. So it's like a huge toxic load every time you get up, right? So prolonged sitting is not, not healthy. So some people, to counteract that, they're getting tables to type on the computer and things like that. But it's just, um, it's, they, were, they were saying it's almost on par with like smoking. So it's, inactivity is a big deal. And it's linked to a lot of, a lot of poor health outcomes. Sunlight, okay, it's uh, Ecclesiastes 11.7, truly the light is sweet and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. Why do I need sun for health? There's four main things I'm going to talk about. Circadian rhythm, so it sets your cycle for sleep and wake. It's a natural antiseptic. We're going to talk about UVC and how they use it in studies to actually treat different infections. Vitamin D production by the skin and then melatonin production by cells through the near-infrared light. So there's a spectrum, obviously, in the sun, and each part of the spectrum has a different effect. There's UVB, UVC, UVB, UVA, the visible, which helps us to see things, and that's what regulates your sleep cycle, and then there's the infrared. So circadian rhythm, It's basically, like we talked about, the blue light, it tells your body it's daytime, don't release any melatonin, and you'll see why your body doesn't release melatonin in the daytime, but, um, and then at nighttime, it helps you to go to sleep so that you do release melatonin. Melatonin is that potent antioxidant for your body to kind of heal up. And if your circadian rhythm's off, it just throws your whole cycle off. So if you're giving your body blue light, at the wrong time, your body actually doesn't know when it's day and when it's night anymore. And you can imagine that can be very confusing for your, your system when it doesn't know when it's day and when it's night if you're constantly exposed to these types of lights. A lot of, yep, TV. TV is included. Any screens, any lights. Um, I purchase specifically lights that are 2,700 Kelvin or less. They, do, they look more yellow, obviously. But I, just, I don't like my sleep cycle being disrupted at night. So what if you don't have any lights and you're exposed to the infrared? Yeah, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. We're going to get to vitamin D because that is uh, one that's a hot topic in today especially. UVC is an antiseptic. So this is why it's very hard for viruses to spread outside because the sun is extremely toxic to viruses and, and even a lot of bacteria. So UVC will kill viruses, bacteria, and fungi. What they used to do uh, for soldiers when they got a, a wound on the battlefield, they put them out in the sun, and it prevented infections when they did that because it's very potent at preventing infections. So this is a study that was done on chronic wounds, and they just... They're not healing, and, you know, they're just like, let's try UVC and see if it'll help, because that's from the sun, right? And that's supposed to be antiseptic. Well, 22 individuals, they had chronic ulcers. They did one treatment for 180 seconds. That's three minutes of this treatment of UVC. The bio burden, the amount of bacteria in the wounds found to be substantially lower after treatment, after three minutes in UVC. So if there's a skin infection, you probably want to get it exposed to the sun to try to help it. Uh, decrease the amount of bacteria, Um, but you have to use the UVCs here advantage, right? Just like those soldiers did back then, it's very potent 
it helps, and that's just a few minutes, do as much as you can tolerate, right? A sun lamp, there's various things that are called sun lamps. So you have to look at the spectrum to see, does it have UVC, does it have UVB? Because they have different definitions. Some of them just have the visible light spectrum. And so it's not going to have any of the other healing stuff. Vitamin D production, your body needs to be exposed to the sun to produce vitamin D. The UVB rays from the sun stimulate vitamin D production in your skin. Uh, that's the most potent source of vitamin D is actually from the skin responding to the sun. Now what carries vitamin D around, uh, magnesium has to be a cofactor. So if you're low in magnesium, that can impact your vitamin D as well. So you want to make sure that those are both balanced. So this is one that I think is amazing. And we're now finding out to use this in light therapy to help people get better. And that's the near-infrared light. So your body actually produces melatonin to the sun's near-infrared light. So it wasn't just about vitamin D for the sun. It's actually also about the UVC and the antiseptic activity and the near-infrared light producing melatonin in your cells. So all your cells start to produce melatonin when you're in the sun. What's cool about it is you don't have to be in direct sun. Even a walk in the forest, it will reflect off and get onto you, and it goes through your clothes. For vitamin D production, the UVB does not go through your clothes. So this one's a little different. You can actually get the melatonin effect not being in direct sun. So being outside is helpful. If you can't tolerate a lot of sun because you're very sensitive, at least be outside but not in direct sun. You're, so the question was, she wanted my opinion on red light therapy. Have you guys heard about red light therapy? It's, it's um, they're basically finding out there's some healing benefits to various spectrums of red light. And so right now in a lot of different fields, they're starting to use it. In our pain management clinic in Adventist Health in Clear Lake, we're actually using red light for pain management, getting really good results. And so there's different spectrums. Some of them, we're using near infrared light in combination with red light. So we get a machine that has both of those, and there's certain spectrums that have different effects. So like 660 nanometers is good for a lot of different things. But one thing I found is it's good for even like hair. So a lot of hair specialists are doing it to try to get the hair thicker or to make, if they do a hair transplant, to help that hair transplant take, right? So, the, uh, and all these things have been studied thoroughly and they work very well. So I've seen people with some great results. So I know after COVID, some people would get this effect where like three months later, they start having severe hair thinning. Well, this is something that could potentially help that thinning and get the hair kind of back on track. But yeah, they, they'd use it for skin. They use it for, the purposes are just, there's a lot of different research coming out on red light right now. I was going to go over that, but I, I didn't want to take too much time. I know it's, it's a long presentation already. So God's intention was for melatonin to be secreted the, by the body all day long. In the daytime, you're supposed to be in the sun or at least in indirect sunlight getting melatonin produced. And then at night, you were supposed to be sleeping or, you know, in darkness so that you can produce melatonin again. So melatonin was meant to be secreted all day long. And it, when you don't have melatonin, you're missing an antioxidant. Oxidative stress starts to affect your health in some way. Yeah, so the way the body does things and the way supplements are, uh, it tends to be different. So you take a supplement, it's a bolus. So the levels spike up for that period of time and then they go back down. A lot of times the body works in cycles, right? It'll raise the levels and lower it, raise the levels. So it, it's not an exact match. If you're using it temporarily, like if you're traveling, then that's fine. But you don't want your body to be dependent on an external source of melatonin because then it'll stop producing melatonin. They'll say, hey, you already got this covered. I don't need to produce it anymore. And so you don't want your organs to stop functioning properly. But if you're just doing it because, like, oh, I got jet lag. I don't want to deal with my jet lag. I want to get to sleep on time. Then that's fine. But you don't want to use it. I don't recommend using it every single day. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Thankfully, our body has a, a great way to recover itself. 
Narrow thread light is able to penetrate through trees and clothes. We talked about that. So is there anything that would prevent vitamin D production? We found out for COVID specifically, vitamin D was very important. The levels of vitamin D correlated with the severity of the COVID infection actually very closely. So if people's vitamin D levels were low, they had a very high chance of getting a severe infection compared to those who had normal vitamin D levels. So I had a friend, uh, uh, one of my colleagues, he posted a video about that on YouTube, the vitamin D correlation with the severity of COVID, and he got censored. So if you're wondering why you don't hear some of these things, because censorship is real. You, YouTube is really getting rid of these simple things, and it's these are peer-reviewed literature studies, and I don't, I don't know. What can I tell you? But what prevents vitamin D production? You would, so if I stand in front of my window, can I get vitamin D produced? The sun's hitting me. Is that possible? Well, the standards for windows today really wouldn't produce much vitamin D. So what percentage of UV light is blocked out by glass? Normal glass is transparent to UV radiation to a wavelength of about 330 nanometers, which is UVA. So meaning UVB and UVC will not get through. Uh, the below, yeah, so almost 100% is blocked by normal glass for the UVB. So you can't just stand in front of your window getting the sun and expect that you're getting the vitamin D benefit. Maybe you're feeling a little warm and that's great, but it's not really producing that effect. So how about that uh, infrared light? Is it blocking my infrared light? Because that helps melatonin. Well, you know what? We have this trend to efficiency. Well, infrared is what causes a lot of the heat that you feel. So to be efficient, they try not to get the, the infrared in either because that's going to heat your house and then you have to use the AC. So now it'll block that too. So the more efficient, the more efficient your windows are at helping maintain a stable temperature in your house, the more likely you're not going to get any benefit from the near infrared as well. So it's like a catch-22. Okay, now sunblock, I want to talk about that. A sunscreen's SPF number refers mainly to the amount of UVB protection it provides. So remember, UVB is what stimulates vitamin D production. So if I go outside and I always wear sunblock, guess what? I will not produce vitamin D really in the sun because I'm blocking it all, right? So you can say SPF is how well this sunscreen blocks vitamin D production. That's kind of another way you can put it. So windows and sunscreen block UVB and prevent vitamin D production by the skin. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good question. So if you're concerned about skin cancer, you know, actually increased sun exposure was linked to decreased incidence of skin cancer, but the difference occurred when people get sunburn. So if you get sun exposure to the level of sunburn, that's going to increase your cancer risk. Whereas if you get sun exposure without getting sunburn, and that's individualized. Some people can sit out in the sun all day long. Some people can only tolerate a little bit. And thankfully, those individuals that can only tolerate a little bit, they tend to um, also produce a lot of vitamin D in response to a little bit of sun. So I think God has made it to where you, t you can take as much as you can tolerate, but just don't get sunburned. If you get slightly red, but you don't, you know when you get burned, it's like itchy and skin starts flaking off. That's when you have to like multiply cells and it's a higher risk of cancer and there's a damage it has to recover. But if you don't get to that level, it doesn't actually raise your in increase your risk of skin cancer. Good question. I don't know if they've ever studied that. She was asking if you take a vitamin D supplement where your body thinks there's enough. And your body does manage levels, but for vitamin D, it's a fat soluble. So it tends to store whatever it has extra, and that'll save it. That's, I think that system's in place to save it for the winter time when you're not going to produce as much vitamin D. So it, it's able to store quite a bit of vitamin D even with that. So, but I usually supplement during the winter time or fall, spring, winter time because you don't produce vitamin D very well. Another question?
no, but now I'm going to look into it because that's very interesting. <laughs> so she was asking, uh, she was saying they recommend not showering right after you've been out in the sun so that you don't lose some of the vitamin D. I know that cats, they just like lick their skin to <laughs> try to get vitamin D. I don't, but no, I, that's very interesting. Okay, so my recommendation is get as much direct sun as tolerable without getting sunburn. You want to maximize your indirect sun too, especially if you're sensitive. So because that's going to have the other impact of the near-infrared light. Now we're going to get to, you guys want a break? We can take a break. No. <laughs> you're like, it's already been two hours. So if you need a break, let me know. You want to stand up and stretch? Just stand up and do something. Because we've been sitting for a long time. <laughs> I'm fine. No, I might just get some water real quick. <laughs> so I was listening to the... Um, remarks of Barry Black, the Senate chaplain, and he was talking at the year-end meetings for the division at the North American Division, and he said that one thing that he's doing on the Senate with senators and staff is a uh, fast one day a week because of the DEFCON levels and the security risks and the dysfunction that's happening, the polarization in our world. So um, I'm asking, he asked all of the general, or the um, conference presidents and union people that were there, if they would spread the word about this, and this was October 26th, so this was a couple of weeks ago. So it's just, an, an, you know, your own choice, one day, and he's suggesting an Abraham fast. Now that's just eat, uh, not eating until 3 p.m. So you, you'd you have water as well. And um, there's efficacy in fasting, as you've mentioned, but add to that fasting some intentional prayer about our world, about the winds of strife and how uh, God's spirit is being removed and the last days are upon us. So that's what I wanted to mention about that. You guys ready for more? I think we'll finish before six, so I won't keep you till six. Unless questions go past six, that's fine. Okay, so activated charcoal, I'm sure if you've been researching the natural remedy world, you probably know about activated charcoal. But if you don't, you should get some activated charcoal because it's very important, especially in my household, because we deal with various things that we use activated charcoal for, and I'll give you some examples. So this is, in the hospital setting, it's actually what you use if someone has an acute drug intoxication, you'll actually use activated charcoal to try to get it. They stop doing lavages and all these other things in the ER. They just do the activated charcoal to bind that. So if someone like overdoses on Tylenol, uh, they'll, but there's like a time frame because the body's going to process things in your body uh, once you get it in there. But there, you know, I've had a, there was a young person I used to work a lot with, uh, youth, and one of them, they were less, they were not even teenagers yet. They ate some brownies. It was a sibling's brownies. And um, let's just say that the brownies had some other ingredients. It wasn't just a chocolate brownie. And so they were, both of them were feeling just like super lethargic and it was clear. Those brownies can have really high doses of marijuana. I'm just uh, letting you know. Um, and so, but he's young, and he's got this overdose of this and there. And so I tell the mom, I was like, listen, you should probably use activated charcoal, like, immediately to try to, you know, mediate the effect. And it was crazy how quickly it worked because he took the activated charcoal, and within a few hours it started to reverse, like, all the lethargy and everything. So it's, it's nice to have it in the house. You never know when you're going to need it. Our, our pets eat things that they're not supposed to sometimes. And so my, my dog ate, who knows what, I think it was the ant killer at some point. You know, you put the little ant killers around the house and the dog decides to chew on it. Well, uh, started throwing up all day. We called the 
the vet, and they're like, oh, no, we can't see you until tomorrow. And we're like, what? Like, our dog could pass away today. They say, now you got to drive an hour to this place. And so we get out the activated charcoal and mix it in a syringe, and we have our dog drink that activated charcoal and pray a lot because I just have no idea if this is going to work. And our dog turned around pretty quickly, actually, and started um, feeling a lot better. So I don't, I don't, sometimes I don't even know what she ate. Jack Russells are the number one breed for getting into trouble. And so I just know, give her some activated charcoal if she's not feeling well because it's probably she ate something she's not supposed to. GI disorders in our house, you know, if we start feeling a little queasy, like maybe we just had some food poisoning or whatever, we take activated charcoal. I'll show you exactly how I take it so that you can know how to use it at home. Um, some people have a very sensitive colon. This is very rare, but some people have very sensitive colon, and it can cause colitis. Yeah, so you have to know which activated charcoal if you're someone that is at risk for that, but some people have a very sensitive colon. So I'll go over that in the two different types because there are, are softer activated charcoals from softwoods, and then there's the hardwood activated charcoal, and they're different. The hardwood's more for topical uses, but the ones from like coconut, are, are the ones that you can use for ingesting or detoxing programs and things like that. Detoxification and cleansing, a lot of people use it for that. The, my main caution is if you're on medication. If you're on medication, guess what? It's going to bind your medication too. So you have to be very careful about that. And you want to space it, they say three hours. I say three hours. I think they say two, but, you know, why not be safe? Uh, three hours away from anything that you're taking that you need to get absorbed because it might bind it. There's a lot of argument about that. There's no proof that it absorbs nutrients too. But uh, I wouldn't like take a supplement at the same time I'm taking activated charcoal because it's probably, there's that risk that it binds whatever you're taking. And I, you know, if I'm taking something, I don't want to just have expensive poop. You want to actually make sure it goes into your body. Insect bites, so all types of insect bites, mosquitoes, bees, spiders, you basically just apply it directly. I buy, it looks like a little lip balm one for charcoal and I just have it available. It's at Charcoal House, that's the name of the company I use, Charcoal House, but I just, they have, they make it for, for NASA, they make it for a lot of the big companies and they do a really good job and have high quality products. Water purification, almost every water purification system uses charcoal. Dialysis, they actually use charcoal in dialysis machines as well. So it's um, a face mask, beauty products, people have tried it for teeth whitening. This is funny, we, we actually did this in our clinic one time because someone brought charcoal and they're like, yeah, charcoal is great for teeth whitening. I was like, yeah, sure, if you want to, everyone wants to do it, that's fine. Um, I've never heard of it for that. So everyone put, you know, they got their toothbrush and they brushed with the activated charcoal. And it was funny because some of our clinic staff were smokers. And what smoking does is it makes these little micro pores on your teeth. Well, the charcoal stuck in those little micro pores and they had like a black mouth for a longer period of time than everyone else. And you're, we're like in the middle of clinic seeing patients and they have like these black teeth after lunch. So it was, it was really funny, but... Um, I don't know if it works for teeth whitening, but people say that it helps with teeth health. So these are the two types. The one on the, the blue one is the one I get for ingestion. It's a detox and cleanse. And then the green one, this is from Charcoal House, is for topical application. So I, I, I divide that. But um, if, it was on emer if I was an emergency, I don't mind taking the green one, ingesting it. Um, but if you have a sensitive colon, it, it can cause irritation. You can get capsule form, you can get tablets. There's, there's different forms. I do keep tablets on me, especially if I'm traveling, because it gets messy with charcoal. On the countertops, it's just, it's a mess. Yeah, I've made a mess before and it's hard. <laughs> you never put the water after the charcoal. You're just gonna get it just all over the place and it's, oh, it's, it's a mess.
Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah, I've heard of people using it for dental, dental reasons and um, or like post. Yeah. Yeah, charcoal has so many uses and uh I um my brother, our neighbor was having really bad intestinal issues. Had no clue, but he couldn't go to work. It was that bad. And my brother said he was convicted to just make him a charcoal poultice to tape over at night, uh over the area that hurt. And did that. He said the next morning drove off to work and he was just in shock, but it, sometimes I don't understand how it's working. I really don't. How I don't know how you put it on the outside and somehow it's pulling something out, but it it works in a lot of different situations. So I like to have it in the house. And worst case scenario, it won't work, and that's okay. It's not going to kill you or do any harm, thankfully. So charcoal poultice, I do three parts: activated charcoal powder, one part ground flaxseed. So what that means. Three parts, you can fill that in with whatever. Three cups of activated charcoal, one cup of ground flaxseed, three tablespoons of activated charcoal, one tablespoon. So that's the ratio that you want. So when I use the word parts, I'm saying that's the ratio. And sometimes if you're using it for something, you need a large amount. Sometimes you're using it for something, you just need a little bit. So, but that's the ratio I do. You can, the ground flaxseed is just to thicken it, make it more like a paste and keep it together. You can use other things. I think people have used oats and there's various corn cornstarch, so you can do other ingredients, and then you want to make it just thick enough to be like a toothpaste. So that's your consistency you're going for. Then you lay it out on a paper towel, and no, you're not going to put the activated charcoal directly on you. You're going to put the paper towel portion directly on you, and then you can kind of use saran wrap and keep it in the area if you're using it as a poultice. So that's how. We do poultices. There's videos online you can check out for, like on YouTube, like how to make a charcoal poultice and things like that. This is probably the number one reason I use charcoal for intestinal issues. So if you get sick, you're traveling or something like that, you can use charcoal. So how it works is it'll bind a lot of toxins. So if you get a viral infection or if you get a bacterial, they work via toxins usually. And that's what's creating a lot of inflammation in there. And the charcoal will help bind the toxins and help your body kind of clear out that virus without any secondary damage. Um, so this is the most common way I do it. So if, uh, if you're having that situation, when you're vomiting, typically I'll mix in one tablespoon in an eight ounce glass, drink as much as I can. And most cases you might throw that up and then you do it again. Uh, about, and it'll kind of help it to settle down a lot faster than if you just let it run its course and you're throwing up all the time. But usually I just have to do it twice. I usually don't have to do it more than that. If you're starting to get dehydrated and things like that, you might need some IV fluids. <laughs> but I never had to go in for dehydration because usually it clears out after like two or three times. Um, for diarrhea, if your diarrhea persists, you have to decrease your water in the charcoal. So you'll do four ounces of water in a tablespoon of charcoal instead of eight ounces of water. So you just cut your amount of water in half and titrate it to kind of help the diarrhea clear out. Cayenne pepper is another thing that I, I like to use. Um, but it has to be 90,000 heat units. It can't be anything uh, less than that. It could, but it's just not as effective. The heat unit has to do with how much capsaicin is in it, and the higher the level of capsaicin, that's the, they believe that's where the med medicinal effect is, but capsaicin is also what makes it spicy. That's why you're going for a higher heat unit. So 
One thing I, I've used it for, I can't say I use this a lot, but you know, if there's a bleed and it's not stopping, count, for some reason, cayenne pepper helps to stop the bleed. And so I've used it for several situations where there's a bleed and I just want to get the bleeding to stop. So, yeah, I don't, yeah, maybe it's like a, a powder cauterizer or something. But you just hold pressure over the area. You apply the cayenne pepper to kind of cover it and then um, allow the bleed to stop it. You usually stop it pretty quickly. If you have a very big bleed and things are gushing out, I don't know if cayenne pepper is going to do it. I don't think so, though. So you probably don't, you probably want to stop the bleed by holding pressure on the artery to actually stop that bleed and definitely get some help if that's the case. It will, st it will sting a little bit. Some people claim it stops a heart attack. I, uh, there's no randomized controlled trial on it, but there are animal studies that show it works in a heart attack. So, and that's usually how drugs are studied. They study them in an animal model, and then they take them to the human model, but it's just never gotten to the human model. And they've studied it for, for embolisms in the lung. They've studied it for heart attacks. They induce a heart attack in these mice. Then they give them um, capsaicin, which is the active ingredient in cayenne pepper, and it reduced the heart attack damage by over 80%. So okay, if, you, if you can reduce heart attack damage by over 80%, that's, that's amazing to me. And it was just off of the capsaicin. So a lot of people in the natural remedy world, I like to listen to what they're saying and kind of hear what they talk about. And then I look at the studies and I'm like, wow, it actually is proven in an animal model that it, it is helpful in a heart attack setting. So this is typically what they say to do. A teaspoon of cayenne pepper powder has to be 90,000 heat units in a four ounces of water and just drink it down like a shot, basically. Or in a situation where you can't really drink something down, it's say a half a teaspoon right under the tongue to help it to get directly to where it goes. And obviously that does not feel comfortable, but so does having a heart attack does not feel comfortable either. Um, so that's something that I, I, I would love if they did a study on it. Wouldn't that be great if someone actually studied it but the likelihood is very low. Manuka honey, uh, I keep that in my house, and it's good for wounds that aren't healing. So someone who is, this wound is just not closing or had an infection. I had the podiatrist that worked next to me, they have this thing called Medi Honey. It's basically just Manuka honey in a bottle, and it looks like it's for a medical environment. But used to do that on those, those wounds that weren't healing up for the diabetic ulcers and things like that. And it, it healed up very well with the manuka honey. If you add turmeric, it, it helps to heal it even more, is my understanding. I haven't done that a lot. That seems like it's just messy. Turmeric is another one that stains everything. It seems like those things that stained have a really potent impact, right? Beets are potent, turmeric, charcoal. So the question was, what's the difference between Manuka honey versus just getting local honey? Well, Manuka honey has gotten its name because it's very high in certain medicinal components. And uh, for, yeah, it's from the tea tree. And so there's these certain, there's like these KPF values, and that's kind of that medicinal component they're talking about, and it has this level. And they sold me on it, I don't know. But I'm sure regular honey is is has a huge um, effect as well, uh, similar to Manuka honey. For, for Manuka honey, if our son, like he gets like a cough or something, and he's like staying up all night. You ever seen that? The child's coughing all night, just not feeling well. I found that Manuka honey works really good. And it's very easy for a child to take. Trust me, they will eat more actually. <laughs> you won't have to worry about them resisting. But Manuka honey, they've done studies on like, coughs in an acute infection, and it actually helps the cough get sued way better than even cough medicine. So it's, um, it's, it's very effective. Comfrey is called bone knitter. This is a really cool herb, and I'm trying to grow it because I want to do my mixtures from scratch instead of like buying it from a, some store because I don't know how old their product is that they're sending to me. 
So I don't like that thought. But comfrey, it's obviously the name is bone knitter, so it helps bones recover. So if you have a fracture, if there's some sort of an issue like musculoskeletal injury, comfrey is meant to help that recover faster. I'm not saying it's going to go away overnight. You put comfrey on it, obviously your body has to recover. But remember, we have to give our body the things it needs to help it promote recovery. I had a friend, she got run over by a truck, of all things. She was riding on a scooter. And you guys, some of you guys might know her. Yeah, did she tell you about, yeah, I was working with her and we did, Comfrey was a big part of what we were using because it's called bone knitter. She had fractures, like 16 fracture ribs and multiple fractures throughout and she had to have surgery. So uh, she was amazing. She was amazing. That was God because I gave her this pain tea and I doubt that the pain tea was the thing doing it because she had zero pain even after surgery, major surgery on the hip and and I was, it just blew my mind. I was like, you just got to testify of God's goodness. But we use what God has showed us in this natural world to help facilitate recovery. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah, they say internally, like ingesting it, something about could be toxic to the liver. I'm not sure what dosage that means or I, I think it works great as an oil because it'll penetrate through the skin and get into the area that you need it to. But I haven't, look, I haven't tried it internally. But yeah, that's the concern is the liver toxicity related to comfrey. For the tinctures, I use the leaf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't use the root for anything right now. But when I start growing them, I'm going to try to figure out if that root's for anything, too. <laughs> Barbara O'Neill? Oh, does she? Okay. Detoxification. This is important to know because remember, in health, you're going to get exposed to toxins whether you like it or not. Um, you're producing toxins throughout time. So how can I help my body get rid of those toxins? Obviously, there's some obvious things. Exercise, you're going to sweat, you get the toxins out. We're going to talk about some of these methods to help enhance detoxing the body. Because I think this is an important part of, of our lives in a toxic world. We know that the number of toxins and chemicals in the air is just increasing over time. And we have to be ready to help our bodies get rid of all that. So these are the detoxing routes in your body, the liver, kidneys, skin, lungs, colon, and lymphatics. So I'm going to talk about like how do you support. I'm not going to go over the functions or none of that. I'm going to assume that you already know what those organs do. If you don't, it's great to read physiology. But I'm going to tell you how to support those organs actually getting rid of them. So how can you help the liver? One of, I'm just going to give you my favorites. You might have a favorite. But dandelion root is my favorite for the liver. And it's um, very potent, actually. What I do is I actually use the root, and you know, I do dandelion root tea. And I make a tea, and I drink it. And it's a liver detox. But you can, um, roasted tastes way better. It, you know, just the raw stuff is weird. It tastes strange. So I like it roasted. Some people say it's kind of that bitter flavor like coffee might be without all the extra toxic effects. But yeah, I try to drink this a few times a week. I did a study on dandelion to try to figure out if it really does help the liver. And what better could you use to damage the liver but alcohol, right? We know it's toxic to the liver. So they gave these mice alcohol. And when they just gave alcohol, obviously there's liver damage. The other mice, they gave alcohol with a dandelion root extract. And there was no liver damage, even though they were getting the toxic alcohol. So I thought that was amazing. And uh, so it's, it's very potent. There was another thing they did the same exact study on, and I'm going to go over it. But the ways I use it, you can take dandelion greens. They grow very easy. They're a weed, actually. Now, if you're spraying your lawn with something like a herbicide, probably don't eat the dandelion from your lawn because it's not going to be healthy. But, you know, if you're, it, it is edible just like lettuce. 
And this, you can eat any part of the dandelion plant, any part. So in case of emergency, it's good to know that, right? That the dandelion weed is edible. So use roots of the plant to make a tea. And then I, that's mainly what I do, the roots to make a tea. You can even harvest the roots, roast it for a period of time, and then make a tea like that. So I just buy it. I am trying to grow it, though, and harvest the roots. So this is turmeric. It did the same thing on uh, these mice, these poor mice. <laughs> they they uh, did it. They gave them alcohol, and then they gave them alcohol and curcumin, which is the active component of turmeric for medicinal purposes. And the same thing happened. They didn't have any liver damage when they did that. So I know in the autoimmune program I shadowed with Mercy Ballard at um, Years Restored, turmeric was a big part of it. So it was a teaspoon of turmeric every day is what they got. Turmeric does go down better with milk. I don't, not real milk, just like some sort of an almond milk or something. Uh, but it tastes way better. With juice, it just tastes strange, and it ruins the juice too. So <laughs> it's better to do it with a plant-based milk. It, it goes a lot better. But it shields against damage from heavy metals as well. So if there's heavy metal exposure, it can kind of help with that also. I don't like dealing with it fresh. It's one of those messy ones. Uh, you know, you're on your cutting board, and your cutting board is yellow now. And then your pot's yellow. It's, it turns everything yellow. It's kind of frustrating, actually. But uh, it works good, and it's potent, right? Is it as effective? When you cook anything that has medicinal value, uh, the cooking method makes a difference. So if you fry, a lot of times you're frying the medicinal components too. Uh, if you boil, that tends to retain the medicinal value or sometimes even enhance it. So it depends on what temperature you're putting it at. Um, but yeah, if you're boiling it, it actually might enhance some of that effect in the absorption. Okay, ways to use turmeric, you can cook with the root, you can ingest it directly in powdered form and liquids, and then there's actually turmeric supplements. Um, you know, I had, a, this is an interesting story, I, you know, a lady was having cardiac surgery, like they were going to cut open the chest and go in there and work on this heart. And technically, turmeric is a blood thinner, but she decided she's going to do high dose turmeric. And she did. It was actually a really high dose. I can't even remember how much she used. And then after surgery, she had zero pain. Like, she didn't need anything. And so she told me her story, and I was like, wow, that's shocking. I'm not saying go do that before you had surgery. But I, it's strange because you would think that it would have made things harder because it's sort of a blood thinner. I tell my patients to stop it before I do eyelid surgery on them. But I don't know. I still try to figure that one out. Some use piperine, which is from black pepper, to enhance the absorption. I'm not a big fan of piperine. I, I think just turmeric itself is, is sufficient, but some people do try to use that to, And it'll, it'll enhance absorption a lot, like a hundredfold absorption improvement. So you got to be careful with dosing at that point, right? Because now you're getting in way more than you normally would have had if you just took regular turmeric. And that's, I think that's where it gets tricky on dosage. How can I support detoxification via the kidneys? We talked about the liver. We talked about dandelion root. We talked about turmeric. No detoxification works if you don't have water. It's, you have to be hydrated. Uh, almost every detoxifying organ relies on water. And so this is just a key point that you have to remember. But the kidneys especially need water to detoxify properly. So you can use all the herbs and stuff you want to clear your kidneys, but if you're not drinking water, it's not going to work that great. Kidney stones. So I went to a natural remedy course by Maimon Wilson, and he's done a lot of different herbal things. It was like a month-long course, and his experience is just amazing because he's just been exposed to so many different problems. But he told me about this at that course, and it was so people get kidney stones, it's supposed to be like on par with labor pain. So one of, uh, one of our fellow church members got kidney, you know, he got a kidney stone. It was bad. It was 11 millimeters. So 
it was basically it was not going to clear on its own. So he ended up having surgery to kind of shunt. And they said, we're going to have to figure this stone out later because all the other measures weren't working. And that, so during that time, you know, he has a bag outside. And I said, hey, why don't you try this tea that I learned about in my course? It's called Chanco Piedra tea. And you know what that means? It's funny because it means Chanco means breaker. Piedra means stone. It literally means stone breaker tea. So I was like, why don't you try this? And, you know, so they bought some. They had to wait for it to come in the mail. Started taking it. Went in for the follow-up surgery because obviously they have to uh, remove that connection that was established outside of his body. And we're supposed to try to remove the stone at the same time. The surgeon says, yeah, the stone just fell apart when I was trying to break it up, trying to get it. And so I was like, wow, the stone breaker tea seemed to really soften it up and get it going. So now he tries to drink it once a week to just get things. He was he pre, he's predisposed to stones, and we're still trying to figure out why exactly that keeps happening. But um, there may be a condition that's creating recurrent stones. So how do I use an herb as a tea? If I buy a, a, like an herb in a bag, and it's not in a tea bag, what do I do? It's very simple, actually. I asked that question because I was not used to making tea. You just take a tablespoon of the herb and put it in a cup of boiled water, and then you strain it out after 10 minutes. And that's, it. that's how you make an herbal tea. It's not complicated. Some people want to start off with like a teaspoon of the herb, but um, I think a tablespoon usually is, is just fine. What happens when a person's kidneys start failing? All right, so what do I do then? I had someone I was working with who was literally transitioning to dialysis. It was really bad. And that's tricky cases to work with. I don't know if I recommend you just go try to work with someone who might be transitioning to dialysis because then their diet is very specific and there's a lot of factors. And if you mess one up, you mess the electrolytes up and they can actually die from those, those things. So these are one of the hardest, hardest situations. But there is something that helps with kidney failure and that, anybody know what that is? You guys recognize it. I'm impressed. That's stinging nettle. Stinging nettle. Um, specifically, it's not just going and getting stinging nettle and drinking tea from that. It's the seeds. The seeds for stinging nettle. You take a teaspoon of ground nettle seeds daily. And uh, maybe Wilson said it when he's working with kidney patients, along with following the other factors that he had to, he said this was the number one. This was the best. And so on the individual I was working with, he went back to his kidney specialist you know, about a month later after I had been working with him, and his numbers started to improve. And you don't really see that for kidney failure patients, but it was getting, getting better. And the doctor was like, whatever you're doing is working great. So we did lifestyle changes, and we did this thing. In that. Remember, you have to treat the cause too, not just like, I'm going to give you herbs, and I'm going to use it just like medicine. It was a combination, lifestyle Unfortunately, when he went back to the old lifestyle, the problem continued to progress like it normally does when we go back to the old lifestyle. So that root cause is just so important. These herbs are not meant to take the place of changing whatever is causing the problem. So dandelion root is great for the kidneys too, so it's not just the liver. So you can do it for clearing out both organs. Parsley is surprisingly Great for the kidneys. And then celery. Some of us know like celery juice and trying to make, if you make celery juice and parsley, it's just not, doesn't taste good. <laughs> but <laughs> I, uh, I was with the individual I was working with, we did this, and he was struggling to drink it. And I was like, oh, come on, man, we gotta, you got to drink it for the sake of your kidneys. So I said, you know what, let me try this out. And I tasted it, I said, man, I, I got to have some compassion. This is not good. <laughs> but just try what, try what you're making for people. And, you know, if they're not drinking it, there's probably a really good reason. And it's probably not that good. So how can I support detox via the skin? We talked about the liver. We talked about the kidneys. And so how do I do it for the skin? Well, after you exercise, you know, you're sweating. Sometimes you got, you ever sweat a lot and you just kind of, it starts to seem like 
the electrolytes are actually on or the salts are on your skin. Some people it's more prominent, but after you exercise, don't go laying on somewhere that you normally sleep on or just go ahead and wash all that off because a lot of toxins just got released and they're on the skin and you want to just clean it off after you exercise or do something where you're sweating a lot. If you're in a sauna. So how do you induce sweating? Exercise. And then there's other ways to induce sweating. Intentionally, you can do a hot bath. Remember we talked about a hot bath? That'll get you sweating and then those toxins get released directly into the water and you can clear it out. Uh, so there's different ways to enhance the skin's detoxifying effects. And make sure to stay hydrated, pull the drain before you actually get up and so you don't want to pass out in the, in the full water. And how I do a hot bath is I drink two full glasses of water before I get into the hot bath. Bring a glass of water with you to the hot bath as well because you're going to drink it throughout. Uh, bring a towel, a water thermometer because you don't want the bath to be too hot. And then um, soap, obviously, if you're taking a bath. Add hot water. And then your goal is a 102 degrees Fahrenheit. This is just for a hot bath. This is different from a fever bath. Those are two different things. Some people use fever baths for cancers and, and um, acute infections. But hot bath is more for um, like health enhancement and just sweating out some things. You soak for 15 to 20 minutes or more. And then you add hot water as needed to keep the temperature around 102. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, a little above your body temperature. What do I do if I can't get someone into a bath? Yeah, you got it, a hot foot bath. So if you can't get into a bath or if that's dangerous, do a hot foot bath. You wrap them up in towels, make them nice and warm. They'll start sweating. Make sure you keep that sweat off because it has some toxins in it. Somebody who was close to me, a relative, went to a, uh, a place, a natural place for healing, and, and he did their program. It's like three days of juicing, and he had used a lot of marijuana in the past, and long since it stopped. Well, all that sweating that he was doing, he said he started smelling like marijuana during the detox part of it for a while, actually. So... Chemicals we get exposed to in our life can store in different parts of our bodies. And when you do a detox, it might come out. And yeah, you might smell exactly like that chemical. So hot, cold shower, we already talked about that. That's another way you can kind of get the temperature and start sweating. Uh, the hot, cold shower, you're supposed to feel sweaty after you're done with your three cycles. You're supposed to feel like you're hot, right, even though you end with cold. Um, I actually like soak clothes after my contrast shower, even after I get out because it just you're just pouring sweat. How can I support the lungs for detoxification? Uh, lung enhancing exercises. Your lungs are so important, um, but these are some different exercises I tell people that you can do. Maybe we can try to do these together. Abdominal breathing, your goal is you're breathing as deep as you can to push your hand out when it's on your abdomen. So see so yeah, how you're trying to push your hand out when you're breathing in and then out. And you basically do that. If you can do it for 20 minutes, man, that's probably max effect. But if you can do uh, a few minutes in the morning to get your lungs activated when you start your day, that really helps. Because it's telling your lungs, I want you to breathe deep throughout the day and just get it activated for the day. Kidney breathing. You hold your kidneys and you try to push those out. That's a little harder. A lot of singers use these same exercises because obviously they need a good lung capacity. And they do these exercises to improve their singing. Uh, rib cage breathing, you hold your hands right here. And you're breathing in to try to push your ribs out and then let, let go. So hold it at the top. So for people who are struggling with like post-COVID breathing issues, I would do this because you got to get their lungs reopened and get things moving again. And if they're consistent, usually they have to do it every hour if you've just had something like that, like an acute infection. Every hour for like the first few days, and as they start improving, then they can start decreasing how frequently they're doing it to actually um, get better.
but hold it at the top of the breathe because that keeps the lungs expanded for a moment for about four seconds. So there's this four second cycle. It's called square breathing, I think. And uh, basically you breathe in for four seconds, you hold it for four seconds, you breathe out for four seconds, you hold it at the bottom for four seconds. And so that's the cycle. I like to hold it for the breathe in longer because that's when the lungs are fully expanded just to kind of keep things open. How can I support detoxification via the colon? Well, the first question is, how often should I defecate, right? That's an important question to ask. And a lot of people don't realize they're constipated because they don't realize how much they're supposed to go in the first place. So this is one of those things that's actually becoming super popular to talk about lately. People are... <laughs> It, it's like a trend on, even on YouTube. So to understand this, there's a gastrocolic reflex. When something enters your stomach, it expands the stomach a little bit, stimulates contraction to help get things out. So every time you eat, there should be a bowel movement. So if I eat three meals, I really should be going three times a day. If I eat two meals, I should be doing two times a day. Um, that's the minimum. Now, usually when you wake up, you're supposed to go within an hour or hour and a half. So you can imagine if you're on a rush schedule, you wake up a little late, you rush and get ready for work, and then you go to work. That's going to stimulate your sympathetic system. It's going to block digestion, and it's going to block you using the bathroom. So that's why a lot of people end up constipated. They're just too busy. You know, their body's like, hey, I'm on sympathetics all the time. I never get to just relax and, and get the toxins out. All right, so... Stress can have a huge impact on, on constipation. So gut transit time, it's basically testing yourself to see if everything's moving properly. You could take a bunch of beets or you can, you, I, I would recommend using beets. So you eat quite a bit of beets and everything should turn purple. So by the time you eat it, from the time you eat it to the time that you actually go and it comes out purple, that's when, that's going to be your transit time. Abnormal is greater than 36 hours. That means that's significantly bad. But normal is technically less than 36, but you want it to be less than 24 hours, ideally. Yeah, less than 24 is the ideal. So if things are slow, your gut transit time is slow, guess what? Things are going, you can imagine food spoils on your table. It's spoiling in there. You're getting fermentation. You're wondering why you're sluggish because it's kind of like you're drunk on the food that's still in there. And the easy test, yeah, we talked about eating beets, so it's very important. These are some things that are laxatives. There's probably a lot on this list. Um, we talked about flaxseed. Go back one, yeah. Yeah, the, you see the dandelion again, that kind of a similar effect. And there's different types of laxatives. There's like the bulk forming, which just has a lot of fiber to kind of get it going that way. And then there's the ones that actually stimulate things to get going, like cascada sagrada. That one is one for um, stimulating things to go. And then you can make a combination, sort of a bowel cleanser mix, to actually have something to, to help things go. Yeah, I need to look that up. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I got to go find the study. I'll send it to you. And so you see the state of mind that you're in impacts whether or not you're going to be constipated, too. So you can't just think like herbs for people. You got to think about some other issues that might be going on. So key point, if you don't drink enough water, you will be constipated. There's... It's like trying to move a canoe on a sandy beach. Like, it's not going anywhere, you know? So you want the water to help things flow through properly. Okay. I think I'll call it a night there. Or... Ah. <laughs> okay, I'll go through this fairly quickly. Is that all right? We know we're dealing with infectious diseases. We talked about for gastrointestinal issues, there's charcoal, and that's probably my go-to for things that are gastrointestinal. COVID was interesting because not only was it in the upper respiratory tract, sometimes in the lungs, 
it was oftentimes detected in the stool. So it's useful to tackle it in all areas. Wherever an infection is, that's where you want to tackle it. Does that make sense? That's a simple principle of infectious disease. So viruses love dark places free from exposure to the sun. We found that the sun has UVC, it's toxic. Um, if you're outside, they found that infections are 99% 90 reduction in the chances it's able to spread. And because outdoor environments are just harsh for viruses, they do better inside and they spread better inside. And it's the oxygen and also the sun and there's multiple factors. It's just hard for them to survive. The temperature as well. So this is your upper respiratory tract. And what in your upper respiratory tract would be cold, dark, and wonderful for viruses to hang out? Your nose. I mean, there's, sunlight doesn't get in there, right? And so the second part of it is your throat. And you see that a lot of people, this is where they get infections, especially upper respiratory infections. And um, that's probably the top two. And a lot of times an infection might not be super bad, but it'll go and sit in those areas then it'll start to multiply, then it becomes bad, and then it'll start to go to other places. Because where does your nose go when you breathe air in? Right into your lungs. So now it's going from your nose to your lungs, and it's getting worse, and it's multiplying. So you can see that if you don't, if you don't address it in a timely manner, a small thing can become a big thing because it's multiplied in that area where it multiplies best. So the same was what was happening with COVID, actually. COVID tended to sit right in the nose and in the throat. And then I've, from people I worked with, usually it was about 10 to 14 days for the first variant. And then all of a sudden, it's like things just start going downhill after 10 days. Um, but usually it started off like, oh, no, I'm feeling fine. I got a little, you know, body aches, but it's mostly just here. And then it would it just rapidly declined after like 10 days. So, and that depended on the variant. You know, that was the first one. And then the second one did a little bit different. And then after that, it was not as bad as that. Tend to do just upper respiratory issues. So what they found is they actually did a study on this to see if povidone iodine, which is an over-the-counter antiseptic, would kill COVID. And within 30 seconds, even the lowest percentage of the povidone iodine, it killed 99.9%. .9%. And just within 30 seconds, so very quickly. So they decided to study if it would help people who actually had or developed COVID. This was, this is not even a new study. This is like 2021. This is in the heat of the pandemic. Oh, I think it was 20, late 2020, in the heat of it. And this is what they found when they had people who took what they did. We said that it was in the sinus. That's when the, the viruses like to sit. And it's in the back of the throat. They did sinus rinses with povidone iodine. Um, that was diluted. They didn't do it straight from the store and put it in there. That's not going to be comfortable. But they diluted it, and then they did povidone iodine gargles because that's going to get the throat. And they had them do that every day. In this study, they actually did eye drops too, which that just sounds not very comfortable at all, but that's what they did. So those three, and look at the group on the blue. That's who got the intervention I mean, the amount of virus dropped drastically. There was only eight patients out of a few hundred that still had the virus after, uh, I, I can't remember how long the study was going for. I think it was, oh, day seven. After day seven, only eight patients out of 303 actually had any detectable virus. So that was within a week. So you've kind of wiped out most of the viral colony and they, it's not a safe environment for it to survive and, and multiply, right? So the group of patients, they, they actually used the povidone iodine. It was 1% was the dilution they did. They had tremendously reduced mortality, morbidity, and hospital as well as financial burden in this COVID situation. So they basically, they were less likely to get hospitalized. They were less likely to die. They were less likely to have some of these major issues that people had. So, and it, logically, it just makes sense, right? If the virus is in your nose, don't create a nice, safe environment for it to hang out. You Basically, put the povidone iodine to help it not survive in there and support your body. Remember, we have to support our body in fighting and getting rid of these things. So if you can get it to a low enough level to where your body can just say, hey, I can handle this and take over from there. It is, yeah. You can go to basically any pharmacy to get povidone iodine. 
Yeah, this food grade. Uh, and food grade hydrogen peroxide is also the same thing, 30 seconds. They found that it kills 99.9%. So um, some of those I'm a little unfamiliar with how to exactly dilute it and things like that. But um, I'm more familiar with the povidone iodine one. I don't like it because it just, it just burns. I would only do it in the case where I actually am sick and I really want to just get rid of it. But the earlier you do it, obviously the virus doesn't get time to multiply and to spread and you know, develop a culture in there. So let's see. Uh, so lower morbidity and mortality in this study. And I just found it interesting because these studies were available to us, but yet you rarely ever heard anything about it, even though we were in the heat of a pandemic where we supposedly we didn't have a treatment, right? But, and, there, and I found out there actually were studies out there. So this is how you can mix it for a 1% povidone iodine, eight ounces of distilled water. You don't want to just use any water because that's, you know, sometimes it could be contaminated and you don't want those contaminants. You want something that's really, really clean. And then two tablespoons of povidone iodine, okay to use one tablespoon. I would say even okay to use one teaspoon because um, it's very uncomfortable for some people, especially your nose might be raw from being sick. And then a uh, half a teaspoon of salt and a half a teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate. That's so that the, the concentration is more like what your body would typically get used to. Or you can use the Neil Med sinus rinse bottles. They usually come with a little salt packet, which has it already mixed. And you can just put that right into the bottle to have the proper dilution. And what's funny is the news was no help. Because even though the studies were saying one thing, the news was saying something totally different. And then, and I don't know what doctors were warning about this. They must not have read the studies. Doctors warn Americans not to gargle iodine to prevent COVID after anti-vaxxers falsely claim on social media that it protects against the virus. A lot of physicians came out about this and were talking about that this could be something we can use as a you know, resource against COVID-19. But uh, they were probably silenced on YouTube or something because I didn't hear them. No, iodine won't prevent or treat COVID-19. There's no studies. You're in an acute situation. Obviously, no one's going to be able to finish a study in an acute situation, but that's how it was. And the good news about this article, it was fact-checked. Now, the question is, I don't know who fact-checked it, but I think they might need to get fact-checked too. So I had an individual who was dealing with, I think it was long COVID, and he had blood clots, particularly DVTs all up his legs. Very extensive, uh, very bad. Spike protein does promote blood clots uh, to a large degree, and some people are more susceptible than others. And so he reached out to me for help, and I just wanted to share kind of the protocol and what was my rationale behind this. And what I asked him to do was daily intermittent fasting. Remember I talked to you guys about that? It reduces blood clots and all the different effects. And I explained what it was to him. I had moderate exercise, so that's very simple. I had him take natokinase, 100 to 200 milligrams. Now, natokinase, it's an enzyme that breaks up, in laboratory settings, it breaks up spike protein completely. So in order to get it into your bloodstream, you don't want it to get digested on the way down. So don't take natokinase with a meal, because it will get digested. Uh, you want to take it uh, um, outside of your meals, so that the digestive process and is not happening. The same for bromelain, a lot of people uh, we're starting to learn about bromelain actually working the same way. Omega-3 supplementation, sunlight, I mean, we talked about these things, melatonin maximization, uh, most of these things I've already talked to you about, right? Nigella sativa, uh, there was a study in the Middle East where they studied acute COVID situations. They were using nigella sativa and one of the studies used manuka honey on ICU level COVID patients and they got a really good outcome, much better than if they didn't do it. So um, I can't remember the mechanism. Yeah, black cumin seed oil is not pleasant to take in orally, but yeah, it is potent. She has, you have a suggestion? Oh, do I have a suggestion? Yeah. So you can do the seeds. 
Yeah, the oil is very strong. Just like for flaxseed, for example, the flaxseed oil, if you, it tastes very fishy. It's nasty. But um, nigella sativa is very similar. super strong. When I took it, I took it in juice. So it helped a little bit, but it's, it was still nasty. Now, um, vitamin C powder, you know, I, some of the things I can't say that I necessarily had some perfect study rationale behind it, but I understood that for infections, vitamin C was useful. He has long COVID. There's questions whether or not long COVID is also related to them not completely eradicating the virus. And so that's kind of why I was thinking that route. So clot specific, I talked to you guys about clots and 90,000 heat unit cayenne pepper. So that's what I was thinking would help break down the blood clots, the DVTs. And then um, DMSO, this one will get me in trouble. DMSO, <laughs> you drank one teaspoon every day. I'm going to leave it at that. And then um, I kind of gave him some other helpful food. So I literally sent him this protocol. We had a consultation. We talked. A few months later, most of his blood clots in his legs were gone of doing this regimen every day. And so that's kind of unheard of, really. The blood clots don't usually go away. But he only had a little bit left in some of his superficial veins. But most of the large clots that were really a high risk, he uh, were completely gone. So praise God. Maybe God just got rid of it. But I just intelligently used whatever I knew was available and allowed God to really work in however way he saw fit. So. I wanted to give you guys that rationale and how I did that specific situation. And that's it. So, you're welcome. Before you go away, it's okay, don't be scared. <laughs> All right, should I step away? <laughs> oh, before you go away, um, we're, we are very thankful that he has taken this time to come here. So we have a little something for you so you can buy some dandelion plants, <laughs> comfy, whatever it is you want to grow. Oh, uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you so w. much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. I actually love doing this stuff in health education. So thank you. Uh, we have the slideshows. I saw some of you taking pictures. So if you want to email our church mm -hmm. office, lives changing yeah, at the Haven dot church, we'll make sure we can send those to you. Way. We also have copies of the handouts available that we can digitize yeah. and send to you as well. Shall we bow our heads for a closing word of prayer? Loving God in heaven, we thank you so much for what we've learned today and for the amazing world that you've created uh, where these remedies exist. And we thank you for Dr. Chung and for his knowledge and experience of these things. And we pray a blessing on him and his practice that he may continue to be light and salt in this world and in his community. And as we go throughout our week, keep us safe and reunite us again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yes. Yeah, that, we could do that. That's absolutely. Let's. Who's the deacons here today? Don, are you willing to help him with that? Probably around the church here. I wouldn't be surprised. Or is Keith here? here? We have we have a whole hospital. I'm sure they've got pumps up there somewhere. But yeah, we'll get you sorted out.